All right, so. Okay, um, first of all, I just wanted to thank the organizers and uh, the LGS Foundation for inviting me here to speak today, uh, and especially uh, to Tracy Dixon Salazar. I think not only an incredible uh, inspiration to many of us, but also uh, was a, a, you know, a key part of the uh, contributor to the research update that I'm gonna be uh, presenting today. Uh, so my name is Tim Sauer. Uh, I'm uh, with Jazz Pharmaceuticals, a uh, neuroscientist by training, but have been um, you know, in, in the area of LGS research and education for about eight years now. So I think uh, this meeting has been really uh, great for me. It's great to see uh, some of the new treatments that have come out, and, and I'm excited to hear about some, some more that are in the pipeline, as well as, you know, just all of the advances that uh, really have, have happened over a short uh, period of time. Okay, so before I, I get into sort of the meat of the presentation, just going to have a few um, uh, points on the important safety information uh, regarding epidiolex. So epidiolex, uh, if, if, if some of you may know, it's a highly purified uh, plant-derived form of cannabidiol uh, that is, is FDA approved for the treatment of seizures associated with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, uh, as well as Dravet syndrome and, and tuberous sclerosis in patients one year of age and older. Uh, it, it is contraindicated uh, in individuals who have uh, hypersensitivity to cannabidiol or, or any ingredients in that product, which inc includes sesame seed oil. Uh, and then, I'm not going to go through all this, but you know, just it ha does have a number of warning and precautions that are related to hepatocellular injury and somnolence and sedation that are important to know. So, epidiolex can affect the liver. It, it can uh, increase this, uh, liver enzymes called transaminases. Uh, that's generally dose-related and more co common if, if um, the individual is taking valproate. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. And then uh, the somnolence and sedation uh, tends to occur more er earlier in treatment and may diminish over time. Uh, and these effects can be uh, more common if, if the individual is taking other sedating drugs. And then in addition to that, uh, there are some just uh, what we call class warnings that are the same warnings as all anti-seizure drugs have related to the withdrawal uh, and increased risk of suicidal behavior and thoughts. Uh, other you know, common adverse reactions uh, that, that, uh, that, may, uh, that, that you may see with this drug include, in addition to the transaminase elevations and somnolence, uh, include um, decreased appetite and, and uh, diarrhea. I'm not going to go through the full list, but please, uh, you know, refer to the full prescribing information for all of that. Uh, and then addi in addition, there are certain drug-drug uh, interactions to keep in mind. I think we've heard about some of those throughout the meeting. Um, and, and so it's just really important uh, to talk with, um, you know, your physician to let, if you're, if you're thinking about starting it, just to let them know kind of the medications you're taking and, and, and how it might interact with those. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, really what I wanted to talk about today are, are the results of a caregiver survey uh, that was conducted uh, just last year uh, called BECOME, and that uh, is an acronym uh, for um, behavior, cognition, and more with epidiolex. And so really the, uh, the objective of this uh, specific survey was to, to characterize some of the, the real world, both seizure and non-seizure outcomes uh, in people uh, that have been taking uh, epidiolex or started epidiolex that also had Lennox-Gastaut or Dervais syndrome. And this was a, a really nice collaboration, I, I think, between um, both scientists, uh, physicians, uh, and caregivers. Uh, and you can see uh, the, the list of authors here, but that included, uh, as well, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Tracy from, from the LGS Foundation, uh, Ann Berg out of Lurie, uh, Sherry Denise uh, Minley on the, on the jazz team, uh, Marianne Meskus from the Dravet Foundation, and then uh, Dr. Scott Perry, who I believe will be speaking uh, later uh, tomorrow. Uh, so this was an online survey of about 500 caregivers of individuals uh, with, uh, that were taking care of, uh, of those with Lennox-Gastaut or Dravet syndrome. Uh, and this uh, survey data um, uh, was, was, it was based on U.S. caregivers and, uh, that had been treating these uh, individuals, uh, these individuals that had been treated with epidiolics for at least three months, okay? And for each, I'm just going to kind of go through some of the top line results, but for each uh, specific question, and these were all, uh, these questions were derived based on feedback, as I mentioned, uh, kind of from the caregiver clinician perspective uh, as well, uh, respondents were asked to, to compare that, that pa the past month to the period prior to starting epidiolex. And these items were all rated on either a three, five, or a seven point scale that, that really allowed uh, for, for the assessment of levels of uh, improvement or levels of worsening. 
Uh, and so just briefly, as I mentioned, there were about 500, uh, uh, um, or 500 patients in total uh, that participated in this survey. The majority of those uh, uh, were caregivers of individuals with LGS, about four, uh, 400. Uh, and you can see some of the demographics here. Um, so the, the, the average age of, of the patients with Lennox Gasto were 17, and there was quite a range there from two to age 73. Uh, most were on about four concomitant uh, anti-seizure medications, uh, including Epidiolex. Uh, and they were in, with respect to Epidiolex, sort of the average uh, period of time at which they were on, that was about two years. Uh, and they were, they were taking an average dose uh, of about 14 milligrams per kilogram per day. Um, the most common other, you know, treatments that they're on are listed here. I'm not going to go through all of those, but I think, you know, the, they're the usual suspects, uh, including clobazam and about half of, uh, of those individuals. And then also I just want to highlight, you know, um, that the majority, like 90, vast majority, and about 97% of the caregiver respondents were actually parents. Okay, so I'm just going to take a, I'm going to go through kind of like the, the results of this survey now and just take a moment to orient you. Um, to how the how the how the data is laid out. So, um, so for each um, each question from the survey is kind of represented by a horizontal bar. Um, and so, for example, uh, you know the top question there, the caregivers were asked to rate their overall impression of, of change in seizure frequency independent of seizure type. Okay, and so the blue color represents if they uh, indicated any level of improvement. The gray would be sort of no change, uh, and then the green would be uh, any level of worsening uh, for each individual item. So, for example, on the on the uh, the, the top item there, when they're asked about you know the change in seizure frequency, uh, independent of type, uh, about 84% reported uh, some uh, uh, improvement in seizure frequency, and then when asked about uh, the specific uh, you know specific seizure subtypes, uh, you can see that overall. Improvement was reported by you know a net of 84% of respondents, meaning 84% respond you know said there was an improvement in at least one uh, seizure subtype, uh, and 21% and, uh, reported worsening on at least one type. Um, so that's pretty overall pretty consistent with what we we know about the clinical profile of Epidiolex. I think one of the things that is not always uh, captured accurately or, or reliably in sort of a clinical trial setting, at least, is this, this idea of seizure severity. And so there were, uh, the caregivers were also asked about their overall impression of that change in the severity of seizures. And here you can see 77% uh, reported uh, some level of improvement uh, after starting epidotics compared to, to 15 uh, or 9%, uh, no change or worsening, respectively. And so overall, you know, there were other sort of proxy measures, if you will, of changes in seizure severity that related to, you know, were there a change in the use of rescue medications, emergency room visits, hospitalizations, or, or, or occurrence of injuries? And across those items, 68% uh, of the survey respondents reported an improvement in at least one of those categories, uh, whereas 12% and 12 reported a worsening in at least one of those categories. Um, so the others, uh, so, so the one, one of the other ways to measure um, you know, the impact of seizures in addition to uh, frequency or severity is to, when we know that seizure, uh, complete seizure freedom is not always going to be, uh, uh, you know, possible for every individual, um, the number of seizure-free days is kind of a measure, or an increase in the number of seizure-free days is a measure uh, that, that has sort of been increasingly used uh, recently uh, as, as another measure uh, of, of sort of like a, of of meaningful benefit with respect to seizures. So across the different uh, subtypes, uh, as you can see here, 67% uh, reported uh, more seizure-free days uh, per week for at least one of the seizure types listed there. Uh, and a minority, but you know, meaningful, 16% uh, reported being completely seizure-free uh, for the past month. Um, and then in addition to kind of those seizure outcomes, I think what's really interesting is that you know, when we, we look at the, uh, the LGS Foundation survey, when, when caregivers are asked, you know, what, is the what are sort of the most problematic areas? In you know, seizures, of course, were number one. But in addition to that, there were uh, you know, uh, developmental delay and behavioral problems really came to the top. So one of the other goals of this survey was to address uh, some of those uh, areas of caregiver concerns. And so, uh, 
changes in alertness, cognition, uh, and executive function uh, uh, were also asked of the participants. And you know, across these different items, uh, and I'll just kind of you know, read the top ones if it's hard to see there, but if, whether or not there was a change in the ability to be alert, uh, be aware of their surroundings, or learn new things, improvements in at least one category were, were reported by 85% of the participants and, and worsening by 16% uh, uh, in at least one question. And then in addition uh, to that, uh, there was also, there were also a, a section on um, emotional and social functioning. Um, and you can see sort of pretty consistently uh, as well uh, that overall there, there's uh, improvements in, the, in sort of the top categories here. Uh, you can see it, the ability to engage with others kind of stood out, uh, whether a change in are they happy, change in if they smile in response to something that makes them happy. Um, and again, you can see sort of the, the overall net responses on the right. Um, and then lastly, the, the items, uh, you know, language and communication is, is commonly a, a concern that's been reported as, as uh, was shared in the, in the um, LGS Foundation Caregiver Survey. Uh, and so the, these items were also queried, you know, in relationship to uh, the, those who are nonverbal and those who are verbal. So among uh, those individuals who were nonverbal, um, kind of the item that stood out the most uh, with respect to potential improvement uh, in 72% reported improvement was the, a change in the ability to look up or smile uh, when someone says their name. Uh, and then lastly, because I, I do not want to run over time here. Oops, I'm going to go back. Well, I don't know if I can go. Can I go back on this one? There we go. Um, you know, it was the change in uh, the ability among those who are verbal for things like, you know, use one or more words to get something they want, say phrases with at least two words, uh, and so on. So, um, you know, and you can see uh, overall, uh, the majority of those that, uh, uh, re that responded to the survey reported some uh, benefit across those, those domains of language. Uh, so just in conclusion, uh, you know, a majority of the caregivers that uh, participated in this survey uh, did report improvements of, of seizure and non-seizure outcomes. Um, uh, and I think what's interesting too is that uh, nearly all of those uh, said that they were, had planned to continue uh, uh, using Epidiolex 93%, and the reasons, uh, the most common reasons included those reductions in seizures as well as uh, non-seizure related outcomes. And so with that, I think I'm still on time. I have this slide up here just, just for uh, if, if anybody's interested uh, in these, uh, you know, getting this data, uh, please, uh, th these were posters that were presented at the American Epilepsy Society meeting uh, last year. Um, the con you can either call or email um, medinfo at greenwichbiosciences.com. Uh, we are Jazz Pharmaceuticals now, but that email address has not changed just yet. Um, so, uh, you know, if you want, you want that data, please, please, uh, send an email there. So with that, I'll, I think, take a question maybe. Yeah, no, um, definitely uh, if you want to answer a question, I know sometimes you guys are limited on how much you can say. Any questions in the audience? I think we can take one. We definitely have a booth. There's, they're out here at the booth and they're ready and, and able to talk to you. And I think that was fantastic. And I just also want to say that when you get, uh, we send a lot of emails out from the LGS Foundation asking people to participate in surveys, and this is the type of stuff that, that um, uh, they go to, and, the, and so this is you guys responding back in our communities and answering questions on things that are important to us, and we worked together on this one. It was great to work with them uh, on what really matters to patients. So thank you, really, thank you, it was great.